So, uh, so thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Uh, Charles and I will be talking about the benefits of using simulation software in the enrollment planning process. The average cost of a wedding in the U.S. is about $26,000. I pulled this um, offline. So the question is, if your wedding were this weekend, would you check the weather so you, could, uh, you can plan accordingly? Um, or would you take your best guess and just wing it the day of? Conveniently, the average cost per patient is $26,000 as well. Uh, and so the argument is, at a minimum, shouldn't you approach your 20, 30, 40 million dollar trial with the same level of planning to help you weather the storm? But Chuck, could I stop you right there? Yeah. With yeah. that scenario, what it draws to mind there is outcome. So $26,000, will it work or will they get divorced? Yeah. Will the patient stay in or will they drop out? So I just want to kind of put that out there because yeah, that's sure. what's triggering it, but oh, carry on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, you, can, you can throw in the recruitment aspect too. We're just talking about the enrollment planning piece, but I agree, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is what I call winging it. This is uh, the common approach, which is a straight line projection. And it, it, it's an unrealistic assumption um, the, the, from a number of reasons. So this assumes that all sites are ready for the same start date, that no sites will fail to recruit, that the, all the patients arrive in a linear fashion, and that there's no pauses in enrollment during trial. There's a number of other factors, but again, uh, there's limitations on this. And so, you know, when we think about how these models are built or how you come to these straight lines, you know, uh, you kind of ask some of the questions is, are they, are they leveraging historical data? Uh, do they adjust for site failure? Um, can you adjust for the rates of the site initiation on sites? Are you using point estimates? Or are you using a more accurate probability to, ex to approximate your inputs? Um, does it allow you to leverage your, your clinical expertise, such as, oops, such as the ability to adjust enrollment rates or screen failures? based upon your knowledge of the clinical space? Or is everybody just a cowboy? <laughs> so um, I'm going to hand it over to Charles for a little bit, and, and he's going to describe a different approach to planning your enrollment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how these uh, simulation uh, tools work. I'll start with a simple uh, example to make things concrete. Suppose you're on a game show and your job is to win a car. There's a car hidden behind one of uh, three closed doors. Uh, and behind the other two doors is a goat, right? So there's two goats and a car. Uh, and you can see in this example, the contestant here has chosen door number three. Now before the uh, host opens up door number three, he will first open up door number one to reveal uh, a goat, all right? So now there are two doors remaining, uh, two and three. And he offers you uh, the following choice. Uh, would you like to stay with your uh, first choice, door number three, or would you like to switch to the remaining uh, door number two? So who would uh, stay with door number three? Okay, who would switch to door number two? There's also another answer which is uh, that it doesn't matter, right? Who thinks it doesn't matter? A couple of hands. So one intuitive response is that there are two doors and uh, a car is behind one of them, so there's a really a 50-50 chance. It doesn't matter whether you stay or switch. Uh, but for those who decided to stay, um, which I think is most of you, uh, you can show by simulation uh, that uh, switching strategy uh, has twice the uh, probability of winning the car. And so this is a simulation uh, just repeating this same game 100 times. And it's a plot of the uh, average um, probability of winning the car. Uh, and so on the left, we have the stay strategy always staying with the same, same door. On the right, we have the switching strategy. Uh, and uh, it's just a very simple example to show that sometimes uh, our intuitions about probability can be easily mistaken. And, uh, building a, a model and, and using simulation tools can um, give us the correct answer. So how does this apply to recruitment? Well, you can imagine these are you know, two potential recruitment strategies 
that uh, you want to implement, and you can use these tools to compare them uh, directly. And you know, in this case, for example, recruitment strategy B, uh, you might find is twice as likely to uh, reach your uh, desired milestones. Can I ask really quick, Go ahead. No, there's no reason. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's just an order. Very different. No, but in in any case, uh, B is twice. Uh, I think it's about two thirds, one third, basically. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> it doesn't. We can we can talk about it at, at the end, yeah. Yeah, very very. I, I, we talked about this before. I told you it's hard to explain exceptionalized. Very yeah. briefly though, when you chose first, right, you had a one, one out of in three, three chance, chance, right? Now you have a, a higher chance, but it's you, he'll, you can break the implications of conditional simulation based upon afterwards. But we'll we'll tell you the how the answer how it works. <laughs> okay, so how do we go about building uh, these simulation models? Well, there's a few different types of inputs. I'll talk about. So as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. Um, and uh, in this context, um, these are things like sample size, right? So like the number of patients we want to target, um, the number of sites uh, that we want to target uh, in the countries as well. Uh, we may have a particular recruitment duration that we want to um, that we want to target. So these are known knowns. They're sort of fixed constants in our model. Um, but we also know there are known unknowns, okay? We, that is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. Uh, and uh, these are some things that Chuck already uh, mentioned earlier, things like site failures, site initiation time, randomization rates. So we don't know these things perfectly, but we can put bounds on them. So um, we don't know ahead of time which site is going to fail to recruit any patients, but we know from previous experience that a certain proportion uh, of them will. Uh, and um, similarly with site initiation times, we don't know exactly when a site will open, but we know from previous experience that they will open within some window, and that window may differ across countries or regions. And so any, any uh, decent simulation uh, tool will give you access to these sort of statistical distributions that allow you to uh, quantify and formalize your uncertainty about these, these known unknowns. Um, and finally, I just want to point out, of course, to complete the quote, there are also unknown unknowns, uh, the ones we don't know we don't know. And so whether it's planning a clinical trial or a wedding, there are always going to be um, events that could uh, uh, ruin things for you uh, that nobody could have predicted. Okay? So these sort of lie outside the model. The model is no guarantee for success, but uh, knowing that these exist um, you know, gives you an ability to make more realistic projections. So what are the outputs uh, of this software? Uh, what do they look like? Uh, here is an example uh, histogram of the, I don't know if you can see the, the title here. It's the predicted time from the trial start to the uh, LSR, the last subject randomized. So you can see there's quite a uh, possible range of um, recruitment duration. Um, but there are some tendencies and we can basically probe this graph uh, to get some solid numbers um, about probability of success. Um, so one state we, we, might wake it, we might make is that uh, if we want to complete the trial by 20 months, this uh, simulation shows us that there's an 80% chance of that happening. Uh, and we can choose any probability we like, depending on how aggressive we like to be. Uh, so another example would be if we want to choose a worst case scenario, uh, there's, if you look on the right tail there, there's a 3% probability that the trial will take longer than 25 months, for example. Uh, this is another uh, example output from, from uh, our simulation tools. So this is the um, subjects randomized over time, cumulative. Uh, and if you contrast it with the straight line prediction that uh, Chuck presented before, you can see that we can capture different patterns. Um, and in fact, there are two particular features that um, I'd like to point out that uh, reflect the you know, complexity of real-world trials. The first is that uh, 
the accruals uh, may not be linear over time. So there's this, this curve you can see um, at the beginning of the trial, maybe not many sites have opened. Okay, so uh, not much accrual happening, and then it ramps up uh, once they come on board, um, and then it slows out, slows down again towards the end. So, so this is it can capture any possible sort of nonlinear pattern. Um, and in addition to that uh, solid line, we have this these dot, dotted lines that give us um, sort of a confidence band. Uh, so at each point in time, there is a, a predicted interval uh, within which we expect um, uh, the uh, subjects uh, to, to be in. So it captures both the nonlinearity and, and randomness that is inherent in uh, real world enrollment data. So all of that, that I've been talking about is prediction or, or forecasting from the planning stage before the trial even begins. Now, of course, we want to uh, be able to monitor the trial and make sure that we're on track. Uh, this is an example of um, actually uh, predicting events. So if it's a, a, an event-driven trial, we want to predict when, when all the events will come in uh, for this trial. And the solid black line here is just the, what we've observed so far. Right? It's the accu accumulated um, events up until you know, 20 months into the trial, we have about 200 events. And then from that point in time, we will then make our predictions to the end of the trial. So uh, the horizontal line at the top here is our target. We're targeting, let's say, 350 events. Uh, and uh, there's a confidence uh, band that tells us uh, to get 350 events, we will need, there'll be some interval um, uh, that we can predict um, that those events will arrive. So, so we can plan both, um, make predictions both from the planning stage um, and during the trial, during the monitoring stage. And uh, I'm going to pass it back to Chuck, and he's going to tell us a bit more about uh, some of the practical issues in this modeling exercise. Like, we're using a model that's, that's going to be more realistic. We're using a model that's not the straight line production. Um, but, you know, how, uh, how do we get the data to do this? Because sometimes this feels like this giant mountain that we have to climb. I, I, can't, I can't get the data out. I want, I want to leverage the analytics that we have at our company, but I, I can't do it. So a lot of times clients will ask us, um, where, where is all of this data? Where is this data that I can build? Um, so it exists in a bunch of different places. Um, in your clinical data repository, wherever you're storing all your clinical data, um, you know, if you have a CTMS, a uh, you know, management system, um, recent studies, you know, taking recent studies and looking at them, um, talking to your country, your site managers, getting their inputs uh, when you're designing your trials. Um, there are benchmarking software and subscriptions that have valuable information. A lot of them have limitations as well. So you want to use all this data. And, and reaching out to your CROs. I mean, um, I'll, in a second, I'll talk about some of the, the issues that we have. but. Um, you know, they're also a source of information. You know, you're paying them a tremendous amount of money to help you. So they should be hopefully sharing this experience with you. But it's locked behind the vault. I can't do it. I have no access to this data. Okay? I've, I don't have any extra money for subscriptions. I don't have any historical data. This is a brand new therapeutic area. Um, and the CRO is doing it. I have no input. Right? So I'm just going to go back to what we were doing before. But the thing is that um, just because you don't have this info readily available, it, it, I don't believe, well, we don't believe that there's enough justification to continue using this same kind of incorrect approach. Right? And that's why you know, we, we talk about simulation. So our approach is that you combine your experience um, and the data that you do have, right, um, the, what you have access to, um, and you utilize software, whether it be ours, whether it be other types of simulation software, to help you dial in the inputs that create these more realistic projections and rather than these straight line predictions. Um, you know, start with what, so for example, you, you start with what you know, perhaps a previous trial that was similar, perhaps one published trial that another stu study done, that uh, another client had comp completed. And then what you do is you, you make your adjustments from there. Um, perhaps you'll create some scenarios where you have higher screen failures. Perhaps you have some that are at 50%, some are at 70%, some that are at 10%. Um, oops. Perhaps, uh, perhaps you decide to adjust your enrollment rates in, in certain increments so you can kind of ramp them and see everything. Um, the idea is that the software 
allows you to quickly perform these sensitivity analysis. So you get an idea of really what are the critical aspects of your trial uh, that, that, that should be. And, and what you're doing here is you're, you're creating scenarios so that when you encounter them in, in the real life, you can then say, hey, you know, we had a scenario with this. Let's figure out how can we get back, back to where we need to be to keep our, to keep our trial on, on plan. And, and, that, and that aspect of it, that discussion, is really one of the major benefits of the software. And, and that's what a lot of our clients say, is that it facilitates this discussion with your clinical team initially to get that, uh, that agreement up front. And you have this mutual consensus on the plan that you're going to go forward. And so you have that sort of leverage to say, hey, you know, well, maybe it can't be this way based upon the inputs that you and everyone agreed upon. Um, and you know, sometimes that, that holds water. Sometimes it doesn't. We understand the idea is that we want you to just simulate, um, understand the trial that you're working into, leveraging your clinical knowledge, and not just falling back on these you know, straight line estimates. So I have a story for you. I remember being told this story about an artist named um, Giotto uh, Bandone. Uh, the Pope, had, at the time, had wanted to commission some works. And after hearing about Giotto's paintings, he invited him to court. And the messenger asked Giotto to show him something, something of an art that he makes that made him so famous. And Giotto took a sheet of paper out and a pencil and quickly drew and with a single motion made a circle so perfect that was considered a miracle. Now, I can't draw at all. Okay? This, is, this is my attempt. <laughs> uh, but you know, using a small piece of software, I can achieve the same results as Giotto. Um, I'm not saying that simulation software can perform miracles. It, it is not a crystal ball. Um, but it is a powerful tool, a tool that you can use, a tool that lets you leverage your knowledge to build more realistic models and to help you plan appropriately, which is the key. And to us, that is a, a great improvement over the current approach. So we're listening. Um, by the way, I, I have a pair of these at home. They're awesome for concerts. <laughs> um, but we want to hear about the issues that you know, you've run into. You know, we are experts in the simulations field. We're experts in the, in the, in the, the statistical field. But you know, we understand there's problems that are out there. And what we do is we like to take that information and incorporate it into our software. So you know, we want to show you, you know, anytime we show you how to create these kind of real, more realistic models very quickly using information that you currently have. You don't have to get tremendous amounts of access data, just you know, leveraging that clinical knowledge. So email us, call us, stop by our booth anytime. But um, really, you know, we're here, we want, we want to take your input and incorporate it just to, to make the whole process better for everybody. Okay, and I think, the, I think that's it.